So two reasons, um, in my opinion, why big tech has roared back. And it has nothing to do with Tom Lee just stated there, in my personal opinion, okay? The two reasons are this. One is almost all those companies are cutting employees. And many of those employees are people that make a lot of money. Let's call it between all the different compensation. A lot of those employees make two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. When you add it up upon thousands or even tens of thousands of jobs being cut, it's an immense amount of profitability. Those companies are going to basically see come through over this next one to two years. Okay, and uh, obviously that's that's long term. So those companies really watching their, their pockets. Let's call it that. Okay. The second reason why those stocks have come back so strong is they all, almost all of them got massively oversold to ridiculous levels. Should Meta have gone down to nine, below 90 bucks? No. Should Tesla went down to 100 bucks? No. Should Shopify went down to $25? No. You know, you go through all those stocks. Should AMD went to 55 bucks? No. Should Nvidia went to $110? No. Okay. So you can go through all those stocks. They got way oversold. Should those stocks have sold off at least a little bit? Yes. They all should have, sold, should have sold off between 30 and 50%, all those stocks. But the problem is many of those stocks sold off between 50 and 80%. And you're talking about that's a substantial difference. And when you're talking about going through a vicious market like we went through in 2022, where the NASDAQ fell at the peak, it was down like 37%, right? You're going to have some stocks just get massively oversold. And that's what we saw. And now it's kind of like a rally back from like where those stocks should be trading. Meta stock, I just think, I think Meta stock deserved to go down to 180, 190, 200 dollars, but down to 80 bucks? No. Did Tesla deserve to come down to the 200 dollar level or 150? Sure. Did it deserve to go to 100? No. That was way oversold, and so I think that's a, an important factor there. Now, I don't know if you guys saw this top news. Google McDougal is going to cut down on employee laptops and services and staplers and all this stuff to <laughs> to save money, right? And they already announced they're doing big employee cuts, right? In the story with Google McDougal. Is a story with the stock market in general in 2023, in my opinion. It really started in 2022, right? I think this is just the kind of grand finale year. Every single business out there is watching their costs. Now, that hurts the economy. That hurts spending. Uh, that hurts the business climate in the short term. But I can tell you what's going to emerge in 2024. Actually, I'm actually going to start this year. But really in 2024, as far as a full year, 2025 and future years, is companies that are in far better. And I mean far better let's call it business models, cost with their business, margins, like everything you're going to see is going to improve quite dramatically in these companies. And I think it's going to make for a nice five-year run where these companies are going to be able to expand their bottom lines at a much faster clip than their top lines are expanding. Basically meaning if a company has, let's say their revenues go up 10 per, or let's say their, their revenues go up 5%, I believe there a lot of these companies net incomes could go up 8%, 10%, 12%, okay, and far outstrip their revenue growth. And that's something that happened coming out of 2009 because companies in 2008, 2009 did obviously a ton of employee cuts and obviously they, they cut costs in their business and they learned how to run their business much more efficient. And what you saw is unbelievable net income growth from companies from all the way starting in, in the back half of 2009, all the way through the back half of 2014. And if you see the net income growth of, of an average company, it was extraordinary during that time. And I think we're going to set up for the back half of 2023, all the way through to about, let's call it 2026, if not 2027, incredible net income growth with companies that's going to far outstrip revenue growth, which is something we haven't really seen in a while. Because if anything, we've been seeing companies have stronger revenue growth than bottom line growth, which is actually usually not a very healthy sign for companies. Always do keep in mind a healthier sign for companies is a situation where, where the bottom line outstrips the top line. Okay. That's the ideal situation. And so just understand when you see stuff like this, it hurts short term, but I can tell you, this is going to make so many of these public companies, almost all of them, such better companies for the next four or five years, folks. And for that, um, it's something to be very bullish about over the next number of years. If you are an investor in the market, which you more likely if you're watching this video, you're an investor in the market, right? You're an investor into stocks. Uh, maybe you're in index funds. Maybe you're in individual stocks. If you watch my content, you're probably more into individual stocks, right? Maybe you're into crypto, things like that. Uh, what most folks don't pay attention to is certainly the bond market. And you heard Tom Lee just talk about the, uh, you know, basically kind of like the VIX for the bond market is basically screaming like, 
the VIX for stocks if it was at like a 50, let's say, for instance, right, which is insanely high. And you heard Kathy Wood, we did a reaction to Kathy Wood, one of the things that uh, Kathy Wood talked about on yesterday's video on this channel, right, was bond investors had the worst year they've had in like 200 years, she gave an example, right, which is absolutely insane to even think about. And so nonetheless, we definitely had a, a tough, let's just call it a tough, brutal 2022. For, for us that are in stocks, right? But I can tell you, bond investors potentially got it even worse than us, which is kind of almost shocking to think about, right? But that's the sort of stuff you're going to see when you have the Fed completely change trajectory from like, you know, Fed funds rate of zero to like we're, we're skyrocketing interest rates. You're going to see that sort of collateral damage, right? And you're seeing some of that play out, obviously, in the banking system. Tom Lee's here is talking about some potential panic, you know, that could come into the market, right? Uh, if more panic comes in the market, I tell you, that's not bullish for equities, at least in the short term. That, that's bearish short term. So, um, but, you know, Tom Lee always has a way to twist almost everything, uh, um, you know, bullish. And, and I've gave this example on a Tom Lee video before, right? To be a bull in the market, you don't have to take Tom Lee's stance in terms of thinking everything means market up in the short term, right? And, you know, I'm always bullish on the market for the long term, right? Short term, you're going to have to deal with what you're going to have to deal with in the short term. But you can easily be a bull over the long term and believe stocks are going up over the next three years, five years, seven years, right? And take advantage of deals out there in the market without having to go to the Tom Lee extent of like somehow always something bad is good. Always everything means stocks up short term because that seems like it's almost always the position that Tom Lee takes. And it's just kind of like, come on, man, like, you know. We don't need to take that position, right? Take the position of being along, take advantage of deals in the market if those deals are presented to you, right? If stocks go down big and you got a bunch of deals out there, take advantage of those deals. You don't have to believe that the stock market is gonna go up over the next three to six months to believe the stock market is gonna go up over the next three to six years, okay? And so there's a divergence in bulls and we gotta, we gotta separate those. And I think that's very important for, uh, you know, everybody to understand even whether you're newer to the market or you've been in this market a while. For Carvana shareholders, like, this is this is viable option. It's either zero or something, right? So would you rather have zero or would you rather have something? For Carvana shareholders, they'd much rather have something than a zero situation bankruptcy, right? How many different options public companies really have at their disposal to get themselves to a hopefully a, a day on the Brader side, right? Which is profitability, which is a company actually being a viable real company, meaning they, they make profits. They actually, you know, can stand on their own two feet. They don't need to constantly dilute shareholder value or constantly take out debt or do bond instruments. But there's so many different options out there. And so I think a lot of times people think like, it's just easy to put a company in bankruptcy and to go to zero. No. Is it, is it, you know, very possible to get a stock to go down 70, 80, 90%? Yes. But that last 10 to 20% is uh, vicious. Okay. Let's say it was at a, a $10 stock to get it to two or $1 possible to get it to zero. Very, very difficult. It's actually a much more difficult process than I think a lot of people realize. And you can see it because there's so many companies that are like what I call almost like zombie companies that stay afloat for a long, long time. And it's like, how is that company still around? How are they still making it? Right. Uh, JC Penney's was a good example of a company that, you know, was always that company for me that I was like, how are they still around? Like it was crazy. There's a producer price index by industry, general freight trucking. Okay. Long distance truckloads has started to come down significantly. It it peaked actually in early 2022 slash mid 2022, and uh, it's been coming down and it's showing honestly no signs of bottoming. Like, I don't know where this baby bottoms out at, but it's showing as of right now, I mean, the chart is pretty self-explanatory. It's not showing any signs of bottoming. I wouldn't be surprised if we move back to the 160, 150 range. I don't know if we're going all the way back to 130, 140. It's a possibility, uh, but I'm pretty confident we're going back to 150, 160 here in regards to this. So if you own any companies that have to truck product around, physical products, okay, for people that own just software companies, something like that, it's, this doesn't really matter for you. But for anybody that owns anybody that has to send product around, okay, uh, physical product, this is meaningful to you. This matters in a significant way. Recently, what's going on here? Well, this is just your traditional, uh, you know, I guess you can say a, a semi truck with a, you know, a traditional, um, uh, let's call it, uh, you know, back end to it. What, what do we, how do we refer to this? Okay. Non-refrigerated, uh, non-flatbed, just your traditional semi. Okay. Um, with one of these trailers on it, let's just call it. Okay. A box trailer. Is that the right, the right word for it? Right. 
if you see the pricing, I mean, once again, and, and this isn't just this isn't just started like this. The pricing's been going down, and it's continuing to go down. And once again, it's showing no signs of a bottom as of right now. Okay, if we look at flatbed, that's the one that's been consistent. Is flatbed? I wouldn't be surprised at all if flatbed starts to fall in the back half of this year, especially if construction continues to slow in a meaningful way in the back half of this year. Okay. Uh, refrigerated continues to fall, continues to fall here. That's great news. So if you own any companies that have to send uh, stuff around the United States that let's call it a food company uh, and it's refrigerated food, freezer food, whatever, um, good sign, okay? Good sign out there. Now, if we look at year over year, right? This is uh, van spot rates down 28% year over year here. If we look at flatbed in general, down about 20% roughly year over year here. And if we look at refrigerator, we're down about 17.5% uh, year over year as of right now, okay? So once again, anybody that has to transport physical products around, great news, great news, great news, okay? Next up here, if you haven't seen this, this matters in a significant way. Basically, trucking companies are starting to go bankrupt. And I don't think this is the end. I think it's um, we're still early innings in this. I think you're going to see a lot of trucking companies, unfortunately, go under over the next 6 to 12 months. A lot of these trucking companies have been barely scraping by for the past three to six months. They've been clinging on. And basically, a lot of them are over leveraged now. A lot of them bought a lot of trucks. And obviously, when you see what's happened with rates, it has just continued to go down and down and down. A lot of these trucking companies aren't, aren't going to make it. Okay. And so what you're going to see is massive amounts of trucking companies go under. You're going to see a lot of jobs in the trucking industry lost over this next six to 12 months. Okay. And this is meaningful in a few ways, okay? It's gonna cause a dislocation, obviously, in the market, but this is something that happens in every single boom and bust cycle. So don't think this is some freakish event. This happens all the time. Basically, trucking will get hot at a particular time if the economy is doing very, very well, right? And what happens is a lot of usually more inexperienced folks get into the trucking industry, start buying multiple trucks, hiring folks, get over leveraged. They think it's going to last forever. And this is a very commoditized industry. And so unfortunately, next thing you know, it's a bus cycles right around the corner. It's like the boom cycles there. And then a year or two later, you're on a bus cycle. And next thing you know, if you're over leveraged, you're going under here. And you got to understand like people got to make it right. The, and so what happens is a lot of the, the trucking folks, they take any price, basically, just to take a load anywhere, right? As long as it's somewhat of a profit, because at the end of the day, if it's dog eat dog world, right? If if you don't lower your price to take that load over here, then somebody's gonna come in and beat you, and you're not gonna get that money, and you need that money, right? Because you're probably clinging on and barely making it. So that's the problem with the trucking industry: is it goes through these boom and bust cycles, and unfortunately, it always takes folks uh, under in these situations. And that's something we're starting to see. And like I said, you're gonna see a lot more of these stories over this next six. 12 months, I can tell you that much, okay? The labor market added 260, uh, 236,000 jobs in March. It's the lowest since 2020, as economists worry recession may be underway now. As waves of layoffs ripple through the long, booming labor market, the Labor Department's job report on Friday showed a continued slowdown in employment, adding to a slew of signs this week that the economy may be cooling more quickly than believed potentially risking the hard landing Federal Reserve officials have long tried to avoid. Now, I can tell you this, okay? It's important. If this was a normal market, I think that jobs report would have been seen as disappointing and we'd like to see a big tank in the market on Monday, right? Because obviously the market wasn't open on Friday because it was Good Friday. So, on a Monday after a jobs report in a normalized market, I think we would have saw, you know, the Dow down 500, 600, 700 points. But we're in a different market right now, a very different market. The market wants to see this. As crazy as it sounds, the market wants to see the lowest jobs number since 2020. The market wants to see it get worse than this, believe it or not, okay? The market becomes more confident the more they start to see even potentially some job losses in a particular month rather than job gains, okay? Because at the end of the day, we've had inflation working against us and we have to cool the economy. That's the belief, okay? I'm not saying it's a perfect scenario, but that's the belief. Fed has to continue to raise rates, cool the economy, destroy the economy, cause job losses, 
When you cause job losses, spending slows down significantly. When spending slows down, there's a good probability you're going to get inflation to continue to drop, right? If there's a lot of, uh, let's say, jobs lost, then it's easier to hire employees at lower wages. Then you don't have a, you know, a wage price spiral that's going on, okay? And so ultimately, it's a frustrating ordeal because some people look at it and like, I can't believe the Fed wants to destroy jobs. You know, a lot of people look at it as it's just part of the process. And there's no way of getting around that when you have sky high inflation, like obviously we had last year, and we still have inflation that is too high now. That's the issue. We haven't fixed it. It's exciting that we might come in at a 5.2% number this month, right? Exciting. It's a great progress from 9% where we were, what was that, nine months ago or so? But gosh, 5% plus is still way too high. We need to get down to 2 to 3% range. And so we still got this gap to fill over this next three to six months to get us to that place where hopefully we're at least in the twos and threes. Then we're in a nor more normalized environment. Then we can get excited about, you know, we fixed inflation. We beat the, we slayed the dragon, but you can't get there quite yet. Okay. And so that's why, you know, I'm not even convinced the market will tank Monday. It's a possibility, but I don't think, I, I think it's very possible the market could go up. Um, or slightly down on Monday, just for the mere fact that I think the market likes this rather than a situation where, uh, let's say, jobs, uh, let's say we came in at 400,000 jobs in March. I would think that situation would likely actually tank the market, believe it or not. That would have likely tanked the market because people would be like, oh my gosh, man, we're never gonna slay this dragon that is inflation and the Fed that's working against us, right? Commodities went up substantially, okay? This is a commodity index in general. And if you wanna keep track of basically how commodities are trading instead of keeping track of them all individually, you can just add this, okay, GSG. And this, this index essentially was up 2.68% here today, so it was a pretty big move, okay? And now this, this, the commodity index in general is next actually positive on the year now, okay? Not something we want to see. We want to see commodities continue to go down this year, if anything, not up, okay? Not something we want to see whatsoever. Now, why did commodities go up so much? The reason is oil skyrocketed today, okay? It made an over 6% move here today. And I can tell you, when oil makes a 6% plus move, it's going to send. It's going to send commodities up, okay? Now, this is troubling because now we're at a position where oil is now up 4% for the year, right? And it's potentially going to new highs. We'll see what happens here. OPEC obviously made a move there. And we don't want to see a situation where gas prices are as expensive in this summer as they were last summer. It's not something we want to see. On a national average recently, we've been about 50 cents to 75 cents a gallon cheaper than we were last year. That's great. We want to see that continue through the summer. So, you know, let's keep an eye on this. This is something troubling I'm seeing. And I got to be, you know, I'll be honest, I was in Arizona recently and I was shocked by the gas prices I saw out in Arizona. I always remember Arizona was was fairly cheap market for gas. And my gosh, it is not anymore. I was looking at some of these gas stations. It was like four fifty a gallon in Arizona. It's like, my gosh, man, things, things have changed in a, in a pretty substantial way. OK, in March, I definitely saw a lot of bears start to capitulate. OK, I just got to be honest about that. You know, a lot of these bears really started to, I noticed, um, shift toward actually less negative uh, stances, which is interesting because the market's still very heavy. If you look at like, let's say for instance, AI investor sentiment, uh, market is still overwhelmingly bearish compared to a normal normal period, right? But I have seen specifically really over the past two weeks, more and more bears start to move to more of a neutral stance, not to full bullish stance, like, oh, we're, we're buying now. No, but they're moving more to a neutral stance, which I think is interesting for the market now at this point in time. And, and you know, let's just be honest. A lot of them were talking about S&Ps going back down to 3,600, making new lows, 3,400, 3,200, 3,000. And as you get further and further away from that, it becomes less and less of a probability, especially given you've already had earnings come down. You've already had all the worries about that inflation. You already had all the worries about that. So now you would need some epic amount of new inflation to come into the system, right? Uh, you need the Fed to continue to raise rates instead of, you know, let's call it pausing rates or, or cutting rates, which look more like the realistic scenarios for this next 12 months. And so you need all that to happen and you need the economy to fall off of rails, which has been actually very resilient. So it becomes a, a, a hard thing to, to get the S&P kind of down to where a lot of those bears thought the market was going. And that's why I think a lot of them are starting to move to more of a neutral stance now at this point in time. Talk about a few of the smaller caps, um, you know, Oatly, Chef, Planet here, okay? So Oatly's obviously having a really good year. Stock's up about 27% year to date. And I think the real reason this one's showing strength is 
basically based upon many of the various moves they made, it looks like they're going to be in a very they're going to be in a great capital position now at this point in time. So there's no like fear around like oh could they go under or something like that. So there's that component. Also, it looks like they're just strategically going to run their business a lot better over this next several years than they ran over the past several years. And it looks like their margins, their margins are already starting to show increases, but their margins should continue to show increases quarter after quarter after quarter. And if their margins continue to trend the way they're going to trend and they bring down costs of running the business, uh, that profitability should be there. And those losses that were gargantuan, you saw this company taking insane losses in 2022. Those should go to minuscule losses over the course of this year. And there's a, definitely a potential, in my opinion, where they start putting up profitable quarter after profitable quarter, um, actually starting as early as next year and just being a profitable company from, from there on in. Okay, So that's, that's I think, what's going on there with Oatly and why the stock has shown such strength this year and obviously outperforming the market. Okay, The Chef really, over the past month, has made its big move. And a lot of people are looking at this and like, it's up another 10% today. It's up 21% in the past month. Like, what's going on with the stock? Okay, So my opinion in regards to the Chef, okay, is... I think the part was a lot of people uh, like a breath of fresh air, the fact that they haven't gone under, okay? I think that. I think also Sam Galetti talking about profitability coming way sooner than a lot of folks expect it. I think that's a like a, a breath of fresh air. And I think there's just a I think there's a risk appetite for a stock like this, right? Because if they can just make it through to the other side, there is potential big upside. It's a huge risk, right? But I think a lot of people are almost looking at Tattoo Chef as like a call option play, right? Where it's like, yeah, they could go under, like if they can't, you know, raise capital somehow, they can't figure it out, right? But if they can just make it through this year, the upside on the other side, right, is really, really significant. And so that's what I think is going on with the chef. I think a lot of people are just looking at it as a call option play and, you know, kind of doing that sort of thing. Obviously, I have not bought this stock in a long time. And I mean, it's been a long, long time. I'm just a holder of the stock and just, you know, along for the ride, essentially, right? It's been a vicious ride. They blew through, you know, almost all their money. They had, this company had almost $200 million at the peak. I mean, it was ridiculous. They blew through it all in a matter of two, two and a half years. Insane. Um, and now they put themselves in a really bad financial situation. But if they can make it through and they can actually get the profitability like Sam's talking about, then the upside is crazy there. And so I think this, that's what people are doing with this stock. They're just treating it like as a call option, man. That's all that's going on there, in my personal opinion, from kind of that standpoint. And the market cap now at this point is so, t is so small that it's like all it takes is, you know, a few people with decent money to, um, you know, put some money in that stock and kind of treat it like a call option play and you can get a big move there. And, and obviously here today made a big move. So I, I would be, it's probably going to continue to trade like a, like a call option, okay? The plane is a very different situation, right? And this talks about 20% year to date. You know, first off, I still like the planet very much, okay? And the, there's a big difference between the planet and somebody like the chef, right? Where the chef blew through all their money, planet's done a phenomenal job as far as their management team of really watching the money, okay? And spending every dollar, like watching every penny they spend on this business. And I gotta say, you know, Bob and Larry have done a phenomenal job really keeping that capital close and not just blowing it, unfortunately, like the chef has done, right? And so the, the planet's actually in a great capital position. I would make an argument that they're in the best capital position of any company in the world that is in the MJ space. Almost every single MJ company is, has been going under or could be potentially close to going under this year. And the planet, it's not like that at all. They're loaded with cash. For how small this company is, they're loaded with cash. Them and Avant are the best run MJ companies by a mile and a half. And it's not even close. No one's even in their same league, in my personal opinion, okay? And so somebody like the planet, I think um, I wouldn't be surprised if this stock's double the price at this time next year, to be quite frank. I think, you know, I think they're going to start putting up really good numbers um, actually as soon as next quarter. That's my personal opinion on that. I think um, Vegas is going to continue to show strength regardless of kind of what's going on in the economy. It's just I go I, every time I go down this trip, it's busy as heck down there. The planet location is the busiest I've seen it since maybe summer of 2021. I mean, I, you know, I went by the, the location about two weeks ago and it was extraordinary how busy that location was. It was, it was unbelievable, really. And so I, 
I would bet, you know, I think there's a high probability they're going to show actually really nice revenue growth starting next quarter. And I think there will be momentum and I wouldn't be surprised if the stocks double or triple up the price in a year from now, essentially. Okay. Am I buying the planet? Absolutely not. I'm holding the stock right now. In terms of all these small caps, I put them all in the same category. When they hit profitability, that's when I'll buy more shares. I obviously put way too much money in all those risky small caps in 2021 and the beginning part of 2022, right? And so now I'm just holding what I got in, in all these different stocks and, um, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. And when they can show sustainable profitability again, that's when I'll step back in and I'll be more of a buyer of these sorts of companies. But they got to prove it now at this point in time, okay? So that's why I'm just a holder of those. But anyways, uh, yeah, that's my opinion on that one, okay? To be honest, right now, the Fed, the whole system needs to actually see job losses right now. If you, uh, basically, we need to continue to slow the economy so hopefully inflation comes down. That's the belief that the Fed has. Now, whether that works or not, we'll see how that all plays out. But that's the belief. So continue to slow down the economy. The Fed's even talked about unemployment rate going to the fours or something like that, right? So we don't want to see it necessarily fall off the rails like we did in the great financial crisis and go to, you know, 9%, 10% unemployment rate, something like that. But um, ultimately, the Fed does need to see job losses before the Fed can be done, really, in this game. They need to see CPI continue to come down, core CPI uh, continue to come down, and they ultimately need to see job losses. And so with some of these sectors starting to experience job losses, um, you know, you could continue to see that for the next, I would say, maybe quarter or two. If you remember back to specifically 2021, there was basically... It was kind of like a war for employees, essentially. And the big tech companies, I think, were the quintessential, um, you know, companies that were doing this, essentially. All the big tech companies were just hoarding workers, literally, and just hiring people. And some people didn't even have roles, right? You heard the story there that they said about the, the guy who didn't even have a job. He Basically, he was employed, but he didn't even really have a role in the company. He's like, what do I even do? You know what I mean? And I'm sure every single one of the tech companies had a lot of people that were just not even necessary. It just was like, let's hoard workers right now and it was that was a whole mo you know like movement there in 2021 okay and yeah that those days are long gone now uh assets have gone down a lot right depending upon where you've been at i mean a lot of stocks are down heavily crypto's down heavily right so if you had investments those have gone down what about if you just held cash well your cash is certainly not worth what it was worth uh three years ago or five years ago right so, you know, because of obviously massive inflation we've felt over the last several years now at this point in time, like a million dollars today is not what a million dollars was, let's say, three years ago or five years ago or certainly 10 years ago, right? And so naturally, when you have an environment like that, like people start saying, oh, shoot, man, maybe I need to go back to work. Maybe I need to start having an income, something like that, right? So I think that's something. Maybe there's a few buy the dippers out there and they're like, hey, man, you know, a lot of stocks on discount here. The indexes don't really, uh, let's call it, they're giving a little bit of an illusion that the stock market's higher than it really is. But when you dig beneath the surface, below the, the top 20 biggest stocks, you start to realize the stock's flooded in the market right now that are 52-week lows, multi-year lows, all-time lows. And uh, there might be a few people like that. I don't think that's a very big percentage, but it might be a few smart ones out there that are like, hmm, now might be a good opportunity to make some money and uh, go ahead and put that money into, uh, let's call it uh, some of these positions. The stock market companies, they need to see this happen, not just from the Fed perspective, but also because there's been um, obviously a huge movement up in wages, right, which hurts companies' profitability. And you say, okay, well, what if a company just raises prices? Okay, that adds to the inflation problem. So if I have to pay a worker $25 an hour to get them through the door instead of $18 an hour, right? Now, either my profitability is hit, which obviously hurts, uh, you know, the way that company's valued, or I have to raise price on my customers, right? If I raise price on my customers, then that adds to the inflationary environment we're in, right? And so it just kind of is like this, this cycle. It just is a vicious cycle to get out of. So this is why ultimately the labor market, if anything, I think a lot of folks are out there rooting against the labor market in the short term, which is counterintuitive to almost any other normal time out there. The banking system can't function with 4% rates. Right? Looking really forward to this one. I was hearing in the back half of 2020 and into 2021, or early 2021, inflation was already out of control. The data wasn't showing it, but every 
single person I knew that ran a small business was already telling me how much prices were going up. This is at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, way before the Fed was even considering being worried about inflation, right? And so that was a moment I think the Fed should have already started to at least consider, oh, we might have to start moving up rates here. We might have to start actually fighting this and talking about this, right? And then they could have continued that through kind of like the, the middle of 2021 and the end of 2021. And we could have had a more gradual increase in rates. We might never have had to go as extreme as we had to go, but because the Fed kind of kept the, the sloshing of money out there, right? And they weren't in, in reality and they were looking at backwards looking data and they were disconnected from what's going on in the real world. Ultimately, they, they lagged by probably a year, if not more than a year, when they should have been ultimately making moves there, okay? And so that, that's my opinion, but how do you get those folks to get into the real world? I, I don't know. That, that's a problem, okay? That's the, that's the issue. Avant Brands, uh, the smallest cap company I personally own, right? This stock has been absolutely pummeled and it hasn't deserved to get what it's gotten essentially, okay? There's a lot of smaller cap companies that deserve to get absolutely pummeled. In this market, I can tell you this isn't one of those companies. When you see those sorts of moves there, right? You're like, oh my gosh, it must be in a bad position. This company right now, okay, is basically has about $35 million of stockholder value, stockholder equity, okay? Stockholder equity of about $35 million US. That's less than the market capitalization of the company right now. You don't see that very often, if ever, with a company. And if you ever do, it's usually because the company is, uh, you know, the revenues are, are plummeting and people think they're going to go out of business or something like that. That's another situation with Avant. They're actually cash loaded uh, when it comes to this company, right? As well as they got a lot of inventory because they've been growing their business. But not just that. The company's a growth beast. And so this is the furthest thing from a company that should be trading at basically stockholder equity, uh, you know, uh, stockholder equity being higher than the market cap right now. Like that, that should never happen for a company that's, that has this sort of growth. That's just ridiculous, right? They did two, $22 billion of revenue this past year uh, versus $11 billion the previous year. That's incredible, incredible growth for an MJ company like this, right? Now, in terms of their bottom line, right? It's being hurt by a few things. Depreciation and amortization definitely hurt them. And also share-based payments this past year definitely hurt them as well. But if they can get on their own two feet as far as that net income loss goes, oh my gosh, the upside here for Avant is absolutely ridiculous over the next several years, right? And so the way I kind of see this stock playing out is I think it's going to bottom likely here in the, the second quarter of the year. And I think it's going to start to uptrend in the second half of 2023 and kind of move from there as they continue to make progress on the, the bottom line there. And if they can start showing profitability for this company, I mean, imagine if they can just get to a point where they start throwing off a million or $2 million a quarter in net income. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility um, for them to get there pretty soon, right? And I mean, when you start thinking about if they do one to two million positive net income a quarter on a market cap of 32 million, you know, do the math on that and run that over a year. And, you know, you begin to understand why this market cap could explode higher over the next few years if Norton and the team can kind of put together what uh, I think they can put together as far as that bottom line coming together. So, yeah, I think this one's a, a tremendous buying opportunity for if anybody's actually interested in something super small out there. It's definitely at least a stock to watch, right? Pfizer stock, PFE, great dividend company. Obviously, uh, you know, biopharmaceutical giant stock's been hit very heavily, and it's actually a great opportunity to be a buyer of this stock, okay? It's a cheap company. I mean, trailing PE7, forward P 11 on this company, right? And obviously, they got a huge boom from Rona. We all know that, right? And which that has faded off now at this point in time. But remember that all that money they made didn't just go invisible, okay? That money's still there. Let's just put it that way, okay? Huge dividend payer on this one, about a 4% dividend yield, right? Payout ratio under 30% for this company overall. Um, strong pipeline for the company. And so I look at a stock like Pfizer as a um, tremendous dividend buying opportunity here. Likely good, nice capital appreciation over the next few years. And I think this is kind of the perfect storm to be a buyer of a stock like this when, you know, kind of everything's down and out here, okay? We're in a day and age where everybody wants to get ahead of everything. And we know in the market, there's a few ways to make money, right? Um, you can be smarter than everybody else. That's not usually going to happen. Um, you can cheat to get there, right? Um, you're likely going down for that if you're going to do that. The other way is be first, right? And so those are three ways you can make money in the, in the market, right? So if you're going to go with the be first uh, one, right? Well, you're not going to wait to May to sell your stocks. You're going to get it done in April, if that's your belief. And if you're somebody that wants to dump out of shares and then buy back at some point in the summertime or fall time, okay? 
And so naturally, I think what's going to end up happening is it's really going to become sell in April and go away rather than sell in May and go away because people are going to want to get ahead of that. And by the time you get to May, you might not see any further sell off unless there's something systemically going on, like something bad uh, in the economy or just in the market in general. Earnings are taking something that is extraordinary event that takes the whole market down. But I wouldn't be surprised if in the future you actually see strength in the month of May and in more and more selling pressure in the month of April overall. So that's the bottom line, man. We're in that. You ever notice how, uh, shoot, you go to a store nowadays and like they're already decorated for the next holiday months ahead of time? It's like you start seeing Halloween decorations at Target when it's still like August, man. It's like, holy smokes, man. I think Halloween's a little bit away. You start seeing Christmas decorations before uh, Halloween's even happen at that point in time, right? You start seeing Easter stuff as soon as they take down the Christmas stuff. I mean, that's just the day and age we're in. Everybody wants to be first. Everybody wants to beat everybody to the punch. And uh, it's no different in the market, okay? These big banks have gotten away with the last, you know, let's call it number of months here. Basically giving their customers no returns or limited returns on, let's call it a savings account, CD accounts and things like that, right? And so a lot of people are looking around now and realizing, gosh, if I put money in treasuries, oh boy, okay, I can make a great return if I move my money to maybe some of the smaller uh, banks, like let's say an ally or whoever, right? Um, where you can get, let's call it a 3.75% yield, 4% yield or whatever on a savings account, CD accounts that are yield 4% plus. People are going to start moving money out of the JP Morgans, which I, as a stock, I personally own in my dividend account, okay? Um, but they're going to start moving money out of the JP Morgans and the Wells Fargo's and the others if these these banks aren't going to give them good returns because people are starting to realize, oh my gosh, I can actually make money on my money again for the first time in the last, what, 15 years? Literally, this is like the first time in like the last 15 years or so that you can actually make a decent return out there. If from a savings account, but not with the biggest banks. The biggest banks are a joke as far as that goes. And so that's going to be a big problem because some of these big banks could actually see money flowing out because people are realizing there's other places to put money, whether it be treasuries, uh, savings accounts, CD accounts, and uh, ones that are actually going to want to compete. And at the end of the day, if these big banks don't want to see their clients' money going bye-bye, right? what they're going to do, they're going to have to up what they're actually paying out to be competitive in the market. So I think the big banks are hoping the Fed cuts rates as soon as possible and rates start going down as soon as possible. Because as long as that happens, they'll be fine as far as money outflowing. But I'm telling you, the longer rates are high and you can get really good money on savings accounts, CD accounts, and other things from other competing banks, that's when money starts to flow out more and more and more. So the longer rates are high, I actually think it's a worse situation for the big banks overall. And that's not even talked about. Everybody's only talking about like, oh, regional bank's in trouble, so people are going to move money from a regional bank over to one of the big dog banks. They don't speak about the other stuff. If we have a scenario in which, let's say the recession does come, let's say it's, I don't even want to say a super bad recession, just a mid-recession, okay? And we see a continued slowdown um, or, or just... Let's call it residential real estate in a really tough place, commercial real estate in a really tough place, big projects in general, anything construction related that's non, let's call it non-government related, right? Because you're always going to have government spend, state spend, federal spending on different construction projects, right? Highways and roads and all that stuff. But I'm talking about building a new stadium. I'm talking about building a new hotel over there. I'm talking about building a new apartment complex, right? A new resort over there, a bunch of new homes and, and everything like that. If we continue to have a slowdown there, it's going to hit all the banks in a, in a major way, right? Because banks, let's be honest, all those big projects are always, almost always funded by debt. And many times those big banks are the beneficiaries of that. And so that's something important. And also, if you're in a contraction cycle like that, right, there's not as many businesses taking out loans in general that might benefit from those different projects and right, whatnot, right? So there, there's so many loans and so much debt and, and opportunities for banks out there when everything's going right. But when you see a major contra contraction or slowdown, it does hit the banks pretty significantly and you see a bank recession over the all, okay? And so there's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. That's why I don't own a lot of banks. I own JP Morgan, which is just kind of a, like a long-term hold for me in my dividend account. I wouldn't mind buying some more JP Morgan in the future, but um, am I super excited about the banks for the next 12 months? No, I'm not, uh, to be completely honest, okay? AMC stock. This stock is down to the 23% here today. It's back in the $3 range now at this point in time, okay? I think AMC is just a good example for us. All of us uh, investors, right? Because the story about AMZ was, oh, you know, we're going to get the short sellers. We're going to make so much money off this and, and all that stuff, right? 
And you see, obviously, what's happened with this company. Like, almost everybody that's ever been in the stock got absolutely obliterated, unless it's from the short side, right? I mean, this is a stock that's down, what, 90-plus percent from the highs now at this point in time, right? And down 72% just in the past year. And for com I think it's important for all of us just to remember, stick to the fundamentals of this game. If you're going to try to out-manipulate Wall Street, that's like saying you're going to beat LeBron James at a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball, okay? It's not going to happen. You're going to get your head dunked on. They're the masters of manipulation. If you think you're going to out-manipulate the manipulators, believe me, you're going to get wrecked, okay? And so just keep in mind, you've got to invest from the fundamental side with companies. And what I always saw as a problem with AMC is no one invested in that company from the fundamental side. No one was like, oh, theaters are going to be so great. Theaters are going to be packed again. You know, and it's going to be just great. And it's such a great business model. And no one was investing from the fundamental side. They're investing from the short squeeze side and all these technicals and all this BS, okay? And look what they got for it. Absolutely nothing, okay? And so... And at the end of the day, there, there's a lot of risks. You know, we got to stay away from the market. Unprofitable companies is definitely a problem, and that's a problem that AMC's had in the past. But also, if you think you're going to out-manipulate the manipulators, I just tell you you're in to get your head dunked on, okay? It's not going to happen. Look at this baby. It's at an all-time high. McDonald's stock is at an all-time high, and they're still doing layoffs, okay? They're still going to do layoffs with the stock at an all-time high right now. That goes to show you that companies are using 2023 as a year to lean up their organizations regardless of how their stock price is done. Regardless. It doesn't matter. And the bottom line is for big corporations, they only get these opportunities to do these big layoffs, corporate cuts, things like that, really maybe once every 5 to 15 years. And so when you get one of those opportunities where you can cut employees and no one's going to ask questions about it, you've got to take advantage of that. And it really started in 2022 with a lot of tech companies, right? But it's followed through now with a lot of these other random big companies now at this point in time. And so as in McDonald's, like, this is your one opportunity. You might not get another year to have big layoffs like this for another 5, 10, or 15 years. And so you've got to take advantage of that because when, when times are great, when, when, you know, most other companies are hiring, if you're firing, it makes your company look like you're in a bad spot. You're doing a bad job running your company. But right now, for this year, you cut employees, no one asks questions, and everybody claps for you. Everybody claps for you. I can tell you that's not the situation when everybody's out there hiring and, and you have all those sorts of moves out there. So it's a really fascinating, fascinating time going on uh, out there in kind of the workforce area right now, right?